Hey to friends, super excited to be here with all of you on this Friday morning, December 15th of 2023. I'm Dr. Minette. This is Painting in Your PJs live with Minette. I am in my PJs. My hair is kind of crazy this morning, and that's how we roll on this show. I believe we should never have excuses for why we can't make art or prioritize time for making art. It's one of the most important things that we can do. And there's a lot of valid reasons for that, which is the topic of our conversation today. So tomorrow, good morning, Kim. Tomorrow, I am giving a talk to the Rocky Mountain Weavers Guild down in Denver, Colorado. Super, super excited to go and present to them. And the topic that I was asked to present on was why do we make why do we feel this drive this human need to constantly be making and not just to be making but to make things pretty so since the dawn of time since early pottery early writing um, early poetry it has always been both utilitarian as we develop the skills and the tools to do that, as well as aesthetically pleasing. And the intersection of those two things is something that just always delights and surprises me personally. And I'm still working on my talk for tomorrow. But part of what I wanna talk about is why do we have this need to create and what are the benefits for us of that creative process? Good morning, Judy. So I thought as I worked in my circle journal and worked intuitively that I would share part of the conversation that I'm looking at tomorrow and would love to get your input on why do you make because what I've seen since the pandemic especially is an increased need for humans to express themselves to find ways to engage in their own creative process from all the different crazy YouTube videos and TikTok videos that were born of people doing dances and silly skits to the explosion of online art classes during the pandemic and seeing more and more people wanting to know how to have a consistent creative practice. So what is this inner drive to make things? That's what we're gonna talk about today. And we're gonna talk about that while we're making some art get my desk a little bit more set up here. Bear with me for just a second. So all month long in December, I am working in this super fun circle journal. This is the first time I've created a circle journal, having a ton of fun with this process. Those lights are like extra, extra bright this morning. It's weird, we have a, a funny glare on that one image there. And I love working on the round. One of the creative practices and processes I'm certified in and teach is called Journey Circles, where we do most of our intuitive collage work in the round. And I have completed the first signature of this book. I've never made a book before where I decided to make the book and then bind it at the end. I know that's a common practice. It's just not common for me, but it's coming together and I've been loving exploring all of the different self-reflection prompts from our set of 118 prompts. I'm still so pleased. She makes me so happy to look at. I'm almost hesitant to bind her into a journal and kind of feel like, oh, what if she just stayed on my desk? What an amazing inspiration and mentor. And because she's a scientist, we might not think of her as creative. But I want to give you some definitions of some of the different language and terminology around creativity versus art versus innovation. There's, you know, arts and crafts versus fine art. There's so many different conversations we could be having about this information. And I did finish my little page from yesterday. I added the little Brad. And so I love this. I've been having fun with tip-ins, flip-outs, with attaching and layering things in the pages. Love how this can spin around and, you know, we can just get a peek at her here. This was a super fun page yesterday. 
And I've had this piece of paper floating around for a while on my desk. This is a, a scrap piece of paper from the Sisterhood of the Traveling Journal lesson that I did on uh, acrylic inks and stencils. I had so much fun with that lesson. And I really look at that gold shimmer. And it reminded me of some of the iconic Baroque and Renaissance art often made for decoration in churches and painting icons where things were often gilded with gold or it made me think of illuminated manuscripts and then I've had this picture floating around and one of the areas of creative expression that's been around since the dawn of human time is body adornment, right? Body adornment from Aboriginal to Egyptian. There are so many classic examples of how cultures, part of their art was body adornment and it was very ephemeral right it was very ephemeral and what do i mean by that i mean it wasn't made to last so if we think about in fact i was reading about the uh, aboriginal aboriginal communities in australia and they are famous for their incredible dot art dot paintings but before paint and pigments were invented they did their work in the sand. And when you work in the sand, it's going to get washed away, blown away. All right, just making sure we get her the right size. Tibetan sand paintings are ephemeral. One year when we were still living in Santa Barbara, a group of Tibetan monks came to our church and built a giant mandala design in our sanctuary it was incredible it was probably eight feet square not all mandalas are round and you could go into the sanctuary and watch them building this gorgeous sand painting it was so exquisite and so detailed my son especially was just super inspired by this experience and then at the end of the week, they picked up this eight foot square piece of plywood, put it in the back of a truck, drove it to the ocean and sent the sand back into the ocean. And it's kind of like my philosophy of everything is paint overable. Like we think that art is everlasting or needs to be, but often art is ephemeral. It's temporary. It changes. In fact, I was looking at an article online yesterday, or actually it was a Facebook ad about uh, color, which was interesting and, and talking about, you know, how pigments have changed or we see how paintings have changed over time because they fade and the paint goes away. So I wanted to create a page that maybe was a little bit a celebration of that body adornment, one of the ways that we celebrate making art. And I think all this page needs is maybe a little bit of mark making. I want to bring in, bring back in, I think a little bit of my turquoise blue. I also like this page really matches my palette. I've also covered up a lot of that gold so as she might she might actually get trimmed a bit because I want to be able to see some of that gold. So I think maybe she's going to go over here, but I want to get some more color maybe down on this page first. So why do humans feel this need to create? <clears throat> it's a huge question. There's a lot of different answers to this question. But number one on the list is self-expression and communication. So if we think back to the age and onset of cave paintings and cave art, or to petroglyphic art, which there's some beautiful examples of in the Southwest of the United States, they were often used for 
communicating with other tribes or other members of their own tribes, directions and locations. They were also thought to be the first incidences, the first incidences of recorded stories, of recorded memories. And so when we think about self-expression and communication, what pops to mind? So one of the things that pops to mind for me are how we use symbols to communicate globally. Stop signs all have the same shape. Yield signs have the same shape. Arrows are used throughout history to communicate movement and direction. Maps and star charts since the dawn of time have shared symbols that direct people how to go, where to go. So it's important to think about your own human desire to communicate thoughts, emotions, experiences, and art is a universal language that allows us to communicate with others in so many different ways. I remember one time, I don't even remember now where I was, but I had met this amazing woman who was had been spending time in Greece when Greece was getting a ton of refugees from the Middle East. And she was going into some of these refugee camps and taking art supplies for the kids because the kids needed a way to express what it was that they were experiencing and they needed a way to relax and play. So many of the same reasons that many of us are drawn to art. And it's why I talk all the time about how creative expression is essential for our own emotional well-being. And there's a new book that came out last year that was absolutely so well written that was the, the science that kind of explained all the things that I knew intuitively or felt intuitively about art making and about how making art is as essential to our well-being as eating healthy and getting enough exercise. All right, that's probably enough blue. I think I'm going to bring in some black and some white on here as well. And maybe I want to bring back, maybe not, a little bit of crimson. I'm liking this, uh, these pops of bright orange on here. And I'm loving just sort of the, the abstract nature of this piece. And sometimes I love just this sitting with the the details of a piece and I got to take my jacket off it's nice and toasty in the basement this morning it's interesting because in the mornings it's lovely and warm down here but by the the mid afternoon because it gets warm upstairs then I get very chilly downstairs so reason number one why we make art is self-expression and communication it's how we communicate. Think of the dawn of the, the printing press and the Gutenberg Bible, which is, I believe, the first book ever produced on a printing press. People say that Don Quixote was the first novel that was ever written and mass produced. And the reason that these books were printed and created originally, especially with the Bible, was to be able to get the Bible into the hands of more people and not just in the hands of priests. And before that, sacred texts were beautifully illustrated, illuminated text, and they were hand copied by scribes. It's a lot of work. So the printing press revolutionized people's access to printed literature, access to printed literature. And it also 
meant that anybody, not just a few people, could have access. And early books were incredibly beautiful, right? Early books were incredibly beautiful. Okay, this is kind of fun. There's no rhyme or reason to what I'm doing here. This page is going to come together pretty quickly and then I will probably move on. I had another idea for what I want to do to today. We'll see if I have time for both because I have a call right at the top of the hour. So the second reason that we feel the need to create is catharsis and emotional release. It's like a dopamine hit. Making art makes you feel good. Again, this has been proven by science to be true. This is not me making this stuff up. There are numerous studies that have been done by the Association of Art Therapy, by psychologists, about the benefits of emotional expression. It's why we have an entire field of psychology called art therapy is because of those proven benefits of expression. Making art makes you feel good. And I think as a culture, especially here in the United States, we're raised in a culture that values originality. I also think that creating art is deeply connected to our desire to create a life of meaning, to feel fulfilled, to make our mark. And creating visual arts is one way we do that. And there are so many different types of creativity. I hear so many people say, definitely needs that black, and I'm kind of maybe wanting a little bit of my stabilo in here. So many people say, oh, I'm not creative. So there's a big difference between being creative and being artistic or having learned artistry, learned skill and talent versus being creative. So creativity in its truest definition and form has nothing to do with art. It's about making things new again. It's about taking ideas and putting two ideas together in new ways. So creativity is about experimentation, innovation, problem solving, and the conflation of creativity and art, I think is very problematic and has created a lot of issues with people feeling stifled because they can't draw. Photography, dance, music, cooking, interior design, physics, computer programming, the creation of artificial intelligence that everyone is talking about these days. These all arose from creative innovation. So I want to encourage you to stop thinking or saying, I'm not creative. And say instead, I am creative and I'm cultivating my artistic skills. I love the word artistry because the origin of the word artistry is simply skill or talent. And when I think about my own personal artistic journey, I've been a creative my whole life. If I look back across my entire life since I was a kid, always been creative and imaginative, but it's only in the last decade that I've consistently worked to cultivate artistry improving my painting skills, my drawing skills. And I think that our ability to create, our ability to create 
is not only the thing that sets us apart as a species on this planet, but it's also the thing that will solve all the world's problems. There are so many people that aren't given the opportunity to express their creativity. So they might be told as a kid, as Brene Brown calls them, so many of us have creativity scars. Oh, don't waste your time. You're not very good at that. Or you're good at this. You should channel all your energy into this one thing, which drives me crazy that we pigeonhole our children for such a young age. Part of the genius of children is their willingness to explore and innovate and try new things. And all the greatest advances in human arts and sciences and technology have come from someone's imaginative idea. Wanting to fly, wanting to be on the moon. Computers, technology, our refrigerators and air conditioners, like all the things that feel so commonplace came from this idea that someone got really curious and ask the question, what if I could? What if I could? One of my favorite, favorite questions. All right, that's kind of a cute page. I love that, super, super simple. And when I was playing with the this book this morning and thinking about where am I go? Oh, she got kind of sideways. Mm. All right, I can probably just trim that up a little bit and we're gonna make it work. Again, just wanting to capture our love of making things pretty, right? Capture our innate human love for making things pretty. So since the, the beginning of time, early cultures didn't just make utilitarian tools, think about pots and weaving, body adornment, but they made things beautiful, right? So rather than having this be one of these pages and glue it on, I want to use my paper tape and actually add it as a, a new page in my journal here. And maybe I'm going to put it on this side because I don't want to cover up all this yummy goodness, but I don't mind covering up a little bit of this. The other reason I think that we make art is all about connection and community. And I should say here, this isn't just about making art. It's also about art appreciation. We gain as much benefit as human beings from viewing art or listening to music as we do making art. In that book I mentioned, Your Brain on Art, they talk about the benefit of going to a museum, going to a concert. We have a beautiful sculpture garden here. It's one of my favorite places to go and take people when they come to visit. And I'm going to put the paper tape on both sides of this so I make sure that it stays input, uh, stays put in my book. Oftentimes art is a, especially art appreciation is a collective experience. If you pay any attention to news this year, you may have seen the Taylor Swift, oops, I got that in the paint, phenomenon and the success of her concert and her tour and her followers have named themselves name themselves Swifties, right? So there's art appreciation in that that is about connection and community. It's why I'm here live with you because I love making art in community. I love making art alone, but I also have a deep love for creating art in community. We use art to foster empathy and understanding among diverse groups of people. There was a wonderful woman that I met in Santa Barbara who had 
a company that was all about world dance. And she used different types of dance from around the world to bring people together. She was, I believe she was an anthropologist, maybe a sociologist, I can't remember, but she had traveled the world over with her son in her academic work and had recognized, I'm going to use up this paint here real quick and get it on my page, that no matter where she went, people were dancing. Sometimes they were dancing in joy, connection, and community. Sometimes they were dancing in grief and sorrow. But in much the same way that I use painting as that emotional release and catharsis, many people use dance. There's a woman here in the United States, Radha Agral, Agral, um, I'm going to forget how to say her last name. And she has built a huge following and community of people who love to dance and have big parties dancing, but they want to do it in the morning and they don't want alcohol to be involved, right? So they don't want to be going to raves late at night at clubs clubs, but they want to have the fun and the joy of ecstatic dance experiences. And she even opened for Oprah, right when the Oprah was launching her last book at the at the beginning of the pandemic. So we long as a community for that connection and creativity in community. Okay. I'm going to figure out some place else to put all this blue paint before I'm done. I'm going to hit this with the dryer and I had pulled out some stencils that I wanted to play with, but I got to get this super dry first. So art becomes a common language. Art, music, dance, photography, they bring people together. They help foster connection among diverse groups of people. All right. I had these out yesterday too. And these kind of mirror the same maybe pattern that's happening over here as well. So I wanted to kind of maybe play with some layered painting, maybe do a little dot painting. I kind of loved this bigger shape here. These patterns made me think about my own connection to nature and nature is its own brand of creative expression, right? When I look at birds or flowers and the just delicate detail of color and pattern that we see everywhere in nature that's aesthetically pleasing. It's often based in science and yet it's so pleasing to the human eye. And humans since the dawn of time and the development of our brains over time have loved beauty, had that deep appreciation for beauty. Okay, I don't want to do that. That feels like it's going to take too much time. So I'm going to go ahead and stencil this with maybe some, where's my white paint? So I'm trying to talk and think, talk and think, think through my thoughts. So the fourth reason why humans feel this need to make art is that it's a way to reflect society and culture. It's a way to capture history and culture. It's a way to create a legacy, right? Think about 
like I was doing some research for my talk this morning and seeing how at one point they found some pottery shards in China that predated any other pottery that had been found by several thousand years. So these bits and pieces of utilitarian art tell us a lot about previous cultures. So I'm wondering if I can just do some fun layering. I'm thinking, thinking, thinking. Still loving those wonky circles from yesterday. So this is kind of fun. Again, I have no idea where I'm going with this. Okay, this one I am going to outline because I think I want them to be solid under there and I'm going to outline it with my Stabilo and then hit that with a little bit of matte medium to kind of set that color in there. There is a contemporary artist that I admire his story and his work so much. I first saw his work when I was in Dallas and I went on a school field trip with my daughter to the Dallas Museum of Art or maybe with Connor, I can't remember. And there was an exhibit of an artist, an American artist from Los Angeles named Mark Bradford. And he did huge pieces, huge pieces. And they were all collages of bits and pieces of paper. So things like posters that had been plastered on walls and telephone poles, sticky notes, recycled mail. And he created these giant maps and landscapes of urban environments using sort of cast off really detritus, right? And he started his creative journey as a small child. His mother was a hairdresser who worked in a hair salon. And the only tool material that he had to play with were those little thin pieces of paper they use for women who get permanents. And he would play and write on those. And then he started singeing the edges of them with a curling iron as he got older. And he has these amazing large paintings created out of these burnt pieces of paper. And then his art evolved to include a broader variety but all of his pieces are these interesting statements on topography, on geology, on what we're doing to the earth. Where that other, this one, let's get maybe some of these leafy bits back in here. I'm kind of addicted to these little leafy bits this week. And so I find his story and his journey fascinating. And the intention of his art is not so much to be aesthetically pleasing. I wouldn't say they're beautiful, but they're profound. They evoke an emotional response. And so much of art is about education and evoking a reaction in people, whether that's music, dance, visual arts. They are often a reflection on culture, on the state of the times, and they change. One of my favorite paintings that I was so excited to get to see in person when I was in university, I got to go to Spain for six weeks, one summer to study. And we went to the Prada in Madrid and 
to see Picasso's Guernica, which is this huge mural in his cubist style, mostly black and white. I can't remember, there might be a little red on it. And the intention of the mural was to capture the impact and devastation of the Spanish Civil War. It's a very intense piece and it's very different to stand in front of that piece and feel the impact than to see a picture of it in the book. And it was a reflection on the times, a reflection on the times. All right, I don't know where this page is going. It's gonna go somewhere. Um, I think I'm just gonna keep playing and see what I'm gonna make happen here. Not loving it yet, but that's often the case. And then finally, the reason that we make art or that we feel the need to make is innovation and exploration. Think about the change from one woman and her loom going from sheep's wool all the way to a dress and the amount of time that took to the innovation of spinning wheels and looms and sewing machines that sped up the process, the creative process. Those all came from innovation and exploration. So I'm curious if you're listening to me live or you're watching the replay, why do you make art? Because it's fun and it makes you feel good because you feel driven by a need to create and contribute. I find so many women in midlife suddenly feel so called to create, to find their creative voice. We spent years, often decades, not making art, either because we were told we weren't good at it or we had put time and energy into careers and family and it never felt like there was time and we were never taught in school about the intrinsic benefits of making art. We were often taught that art for art's sake didn't have value. It was only for the select few that since the Industrial Revolution, we have been a culture of productivity, of do, 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 busy, 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 go, go, go. And we lost the ability to spend more time in creative play, which is where innovation and exploration happen. Agreed, Kim. Making art is for well-being. It's therapy, 100%. And I would say for me personally, it's twofold, right? It's, uh, it's both the therapeutic nature of it, but there's the joyful aspect of it as well. Art for art's sake. I make it because it's fun and it makes me feel good. And I get a lot of pleasure out of creating things that are beautiful whether that I'm making them for others or making them to hang in my own home. Okay, this is a silly, fun little page. Don't know where it's going. I like that it's kind of messy. I like there's um, an interesting sort of contradiction between these two pages of this I love that, Judy. Make art and give it away. Beautiful. The simplicity, sort of the, the very natural, right? Like this has that sort of Baroque over the, the top gilded feel and this, you know, body adornment that speaks of so much wealth and extravagance. And then this feels more like folk art. Simplicity. I want to make it pretty and I have limited tools. I have a limited palette. 
that doesn't mean I can't make it pretty. So I like the, the contradiction between these two pages of the simple that represents my connection to nature and this extravagant, I do love bling. I do like to dress up on occasion. I love metallics and sparkly things, right? And so it captures these different essences of me that I have deep appreciation for iconic art, for visiting churches, for seeing beautiful jewelry. And I love the simplicity of being out in nature and looking at the beauty of a flower. And I think we do get way too caught up in what other people say about our art. And that the more that we can lean into, I'm making art because it makes me feel good, the more impact, impactful the, the, the practice is for ourselves. And the more that you lean into loving your art, letting go of that inner critical voice, the more others will love your art. The more confident you are about sharing it, the more others will admire it and it will give them courage to find their own creative voice as well. And of course, sharing takes a tremendous amount of courage and there's nothing wrong for making art for you that you just keep to yourself. Judy, you're the one that's a gardener, right? You love gardening and having a beautiful garden. That's such a creative expression. I like to have and enjoy a beautiful garden. I don't like to garden. All right, get a little bit of depth on there with that black. And the benefits of making, whether it's knitting and crocheting, whether it's designing clothing or jewelry, dancing, photography, whatever the form of writing, creative expression that's unique and personal to you. We finally have proven with science what the benefits are, right? The benefits are our emotional well-being. Making art is essential to our cognitive development at any age. One of the things that I deeply appreciated about the book, Your Brain on Art, uh, my mom has Parkinson's and there was a whole section in the book about dance and movement and art making for people with Parkinson's and what the benefit is of art for people with Parkinson's. It's been proven how beneficial art is for kids. And I remember in the in the 90s, there was a, a big movement by a bunch of musicians because they were starting to cut art and music programs from schools. But science and education studies have shown that kids that are given the opportunity to express themselves creatively and make art who learn and study music especially are better at math and that when you separate those things out it has a negative impact so making art is important for me as we age okay i'm going to call that page done as we age we want to keep our brains limber learning something new something that feels hard like learning to draw is hard for me right is hard for me and yet it's so good for my cognitive development for keeping my brain limber and of course the biggest benefit of art is cultural enrichment so art preserves and celebrates national uh, heritage cultural heritages right it promotes cross-cultural understanding i remember gosh where were we were we in yellowstone a couple of years ago 
I don't know, somewhere on our travels, we were with the kids and there was uh, a Native American tribe dancing in their traditional dress. And it was that moment of understanding, cross-cultural understanding, exposure to how someone else lives and expresses themselves through, not costume, but through uh, body adornment and the beautiful clothing that they were wearing and the dance itself was a storytelling dance and so I think it's so important to remember that everything that we create has the potential to communicate who we are, how we want to live, how we want to be seen and recognized by others. So thank you for listening to all of my ramblings today, whether you're watching the replay or joining me live, thank you. And I've got to take all of these thoughts that are rumbling around in my head today and turn them into a 45 minute presentation and slideshow for tomorrow. So I have my work cut out for me today. The outline is done. I know where I'm going, but I still have quite a bit of work to do. And I, as I always like to do, am going to just take whatever paint is left on my palette. And my brush is still pretty wet. And get some more layers down on these pages. and use up all the paint on my palette. Can't stand to waste paint. Even if I never see these layers, the more layers we add to our art, the richer they become. Kind of in the same idea of mixed media to me is always like a palimpsest. And if you don't know what a palimpsest is, so think back to ancient times before they learned how to make paper. They would often write on stone, like the Rosetta Stone, or they would write on skin or papyrus. And they would reuse these surfaces over and over again. And they would scrape away or chisel away what was already there. And then write over the top of that with new messages, images, stories, whatever. But because the substrates were imperfect, it was difficult to completely eradicate or erase whatever was underneath. And so there might be words or characters or lines that would show through, that would show through and intermix and mingle with that whatever the, the current message that was being shared was. And the combination of the old and the new would create unexpected and new meaning. So that is what a palimpsest is. I know I've always loved that word. It's one of my favorite words and I love the concept of that. And I feel like that's what mixed media art is. It's a palimpsest of layers where every layer people get so attached and they don't want to cover up their layers. But the richness of what's underneath adds to the piece. Those layers of story are there. All right, my friends, I think that's it for today. Two very, very different little spreads here that all kind of speak to different reasons why we make art and why we create. Thanks for listening to my ramblings today. I appreciate you. Have a beautiful rest of your day. I'll be back on Sunday morning. I'll be driving to Denver tomorrow morning early, um, but I will be back on Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Mountain Time. Bye-bye, everybody.